take a famous cartoon character, add a hot new comedic actor, and put the entire thing on the big screen, how could this possibly miss? This is a look back at the Popeye movie, which came out in 1980, starred Robin Williams and Shelley Duvall. Paramount made it after they failed to secure the rights to Annie, which is interesting. And this is the reason Popeye was a musical. It was, of course, considered a major disappointment after really large expectations. Sometimes things just don't pan out. That's what we're going to look at here today on the Everything 80s podcast. Thanks for coming on out. I'm Jamie. I look back at all the great things that we love so much about the 1980s. Today's all about the Popeye movie. You might not have seen this thing in a while. You might not have seen it ever. A lot of people didn't. It slowly gained a little bit of an audience over the years, but that's what we're going to look at here today. But before we start, if you haven't already, feel free to subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. All the cool kids are doing it. Okay, here we go. I think I love the theatrical misses of the 1980s as much as I love the gigantic hits. And, you know, I mean, there, there's so many classic examples over the years, specifically to the 80s, Howard the Duck, which I've covered a lot of times. I did a whole review of that over at patreon.com. Uh, as part of the Everything 80s Movie Club. If you want to check that out, patreon.com slash 80s, or there'll be a link wherever you're listening. Then there's Mac and Me, one of the worst movies of all time. And then, you know, in the last few years, the Cats movie comes to mind as just complete train wrecks. And the thing with the Popeye movie is this looked to be a sure thing. You had one of the hottest things going in Robin Williams, a beloved all-time character in Popeye, and the right timing during the 1980s, but it just didn't work out. So we'll start with a quick history on Popeye, the character itself, which is quite intriguing. It's a real like trip down memory lane because Popeye predates pretty much all superheroes. And the crazy thing is he's actually based on a real life person. You can look this up. It's a guy named Frank Rocky Feigl or Feigl, F-I-E-G-E-L. Do a Google image search and this will blow your mind at what you're looking at if you've never seen this before. So this is a guy who lived from 1868 to 1947. And a cartoonist creator named LZ Chrysler Seeger created the character of Popeye based on this guy. And the character Popeye first appeared in the King Features Daily comic strip. That very first appearance was on January 17th, 1929, where he started out as a one-eyed sailor who got luck by rubbing the head of something they called the Wiffle Hen. The character of Olive Oil actually predates Popeye by another good 10 years. And the first appearance of Popeye was in the Olive Oil comic strip. Popeye was meant to be a one-off character. Kind of like how Steve Urkel was originally on Family Matters. But in this particular strip where he first appeared, he appears to help Olive's brother, Castor Oil, get it, go to a casino for Castor to gamble against the mob. They hire Popeye to captain the ship and lets Castor rub the Wiffle Hen for luck. Popeye ends up getting shot in this comic strip, but he survives because he too rubbed the head of the Wiffle Hen. A lot of, I don't know what they were doing back then. Oh, I think it's probably pretty clear. Um, yeah, there's a lot of prevalent opium use in the 20s and 30s. But this leads to the rise of Popeye. And that would actually be a good movie in itself, a good movie title, The Rise of Popeye. Anyway, the character of Popeye ended up being this big hit despite his brief appearance. Popular reader reaction created demand for his regular return. Again, kind of like the Steve Urkel thing. The combo of Popeye and olive oil caught on really quick, and even after the death of the original creator in 1938, the comic strip lived on. They brought in other artists to continue the story, and then we met new characters like Bluto, for example. Again, another side note, Bluto and olive oil, oil are also said to be based on real people, which is crazy. It's hard to picture, but the character Popeye is said to be the big influence on the superheroes we know today. That's why when I said he really predates all this stuff, he predates Superman, Batman, Captain America. And again, they are said to have been drawn on the influence of Popeye. Kind of, he's kind of like a superhero, but not exactly, but he can get superpowers, whatever. Either way, he was, you know, uh, an important influence in the history of comic books. 
I mean, he's not a superhero in the traditional sense, but he does have those traits that we associate with superheroes, such as bravery, saving the damsel in distress, fending off the evil, brutish adversaries, all that stuff. It's all there in the original Popeye. Popeye would continue into the mainstream with animated cartoons starting as far back as 1932 and then on into the 60s. There were comic books, and then as the years went on, the all-new Popeye Hour debuted in 1978. Popeye was pretty hot stuff, and this popularity would go on to influence the video game industry. And this is a crazy story. I've done a whole episode on this that I won't get fully into, but you can go back and look at the archives. It's basically Popeye led to the creation of Super Mario Brothers. When Nintendo was trying to come up with new games to launch in the U.S., they saw that Popeye was a really hot character, especially Popeye, Olive Oil, and Pluto. So they wanted to take that, but they couldn't get the rights to it. So they came up with their own version based on the same characters. So Mario, what would become Mario, kind of based on Popeye, Popeye, then you have what we now consider Princess Peach. That was Olive Oil. And then instead of Pluto, they used something that looked the same in that gorilla appearance, and that gave birth to Donkey Kong. That created that whole game, and then that led to Nintendo's growth. And it's a pretty crazy story, basically all because they couldn't get the rights of all the Popeye characters. So let's move on to the time the movie comes around. And here's a quick... If you've never... Like I said, not a lot of people have seen this movie, but we start off meeting Popeye and he lands in the town of Sweet Haven. He is trying to find his father and then he ends up taking a room at the oil lodging house. Oh, why L? We also meet the daughter of the oil family named Olive, who is engaged to the brutish Bluto in a weird beauty and the beast situation. Popeye hasn't really fit in with the residents of Sweet Haven and he and Olive meet one night at a town party. They then, for some reason, find an abandoned baby floating in, the ba- in a basket similar to Moses. The two of them adopt this kid, and they named him Sweet Pea. Side note, Sweet Pea's existence in the comics, um, he had like weird, different brief appearances here and there. He was put in the movie to replace the more prominent Popeye character, Eugene the Jeep. If you've ever read these comics or seen the old stuff, he was this magical sort of leopard cat which was a big part of the Popeye lore but creating this Eugene leopard cat character was just too difficult because of the you know technological limitations of the 1980s they you know there's no way they could CGI anything like this it was just too difficult so they went with a human child instead so back to the story Bluto goes nuts and he gets back at them by uh taking on the whole oil family somehow. Popeye comes to the rescue by then raising money through a boxing match against Oxblood Oxheart. It, you, you kind of have to see this thing to believe it. It turns out that Sweet Pea has his own magical abilities and he can predict the future with whistles. Maybe there's more opium happening in the 80s than we realize. This ability is exploited at horse races by Wimpy. You probably remember Wimpy from the comics. But Popeye goes nuts and he puts a stop to this whole thing. Popeye has now earned the respect of the town. And by dealing with this corrupt taxman that's involved... Um, he's, you know, trying to be the hero for the town. But while this is going on, Sweet Pea is captured by Bluto. Popeye then finds his father, who is aboard a ship, and chases after Bluto, who's also captured olive oil, kind of harkening back to the original comic. And then you can see this whole Donkey Kong connection here. They all end up at Scab Island, where Popeye fights Bluto. Popeye is being overpowered until the finally introduced the spinach in you know out of nowhere they haven't really totally made reference to this thing Uh, but we have found out that Popeye hates spinach he's able to get it down he's able to eat it it gives him that whole boost where he defeats Bluto and then a giant octopus for some reason that's coming to the movie basically Popeye has saved the day and he's got this whole newfound appreciation for spinach everyone's happy you know sail off into the sunset the end So let's look at how this whole movie came together and how this was really because of Annie, how I mentioned at the top of the show. And again, Annie is a very old comic strip itself. It goes way back. 
And before the Annie movie came out, there was a bidding war in the late 70s between Paramount Pictures and Columbia Pictures over the rights to an Annie movie. But it wasn't just the movie. They wanted full control of the comic strip and then the Broadway musical. Similar to Popeye, it's easy to forget that Annie was a powerful enterprise back in the day. So Columbia obviously won and it paid off big time. The movie was a massive success and a beloved favorite of millions. I mean, I don't know anyone who's not seen Annie. The soundtrack was iconic. And again, you probably don't know anyone who doesn't know it or at least knows the music. Every, this is part of like the pop culture zeitgeist. That's how big Annie is. So now Paramount is livid. They missed out on an enormous thing, and they went to find another comic strip character they could turn into a musical movie. Again, that's if you've ever wondered why Popeye is a musical. Paramount owned the rights to Popeye and thought, why not, let's give this a shot and greenlit the movie way back in 1977. There was some confusion about who owned the rights to the movie. King Features owned the TV rights, but since Paramount had made those early Popeye cartoons from the 1930s, it allowed them to film rights because those cartoons were first shown in movie theaters. But then putting this thing together was a borderline nightmare. The script was written by Jules Pfeiffer, and the music would be composed by Harry Nielsen. The movie would go through several different directors until Robert Altman finally came on board. There was also the big issue of who could play these cartoons and make them come to life. Olive Oil and Popeye didn't seem like they could be played by regular people. The first thing here to remember is that Robin Williams was only just starting to get big. He was quickly rising up through the ranks, but you know, far from a household name. You had to be like a big comedy fan to really know who he was. You know, slowly coming on the scene. The original choice, believe it or not, was Dustin Hoffman. Hoffman eventually walked away from the project. But it was thought the growing popularity of Williams, now because of the success of Mork and Mindy, made him a strong backup choice. Olive Oil was originally going to be played by Lily Tomlin. She left and Gilda Radner was actually the next choice, who could have been really good too. Her manager begged her not to take the role, as it was thought that it would hurt her career. Now next in line is Shelley Duvall, fresh off her traumatic experience with Stanley Kubrick and The Shining. And if you're new here and you like The Shining, I've got a whole bunch on The Shining, some past episodes if you want to go check those out. So one big hassle here is that of Popeye's arms, the giant forearmed look that everyone knows with Popeye. It wasn't easy to create the giant giant forms that would get bigger after Popeye ate spinach. Again, you know, no CGI, limited, limited technical innovations for that sort of effect. Uh, so they started out using some inflatables. This wasn't working out, so a custom pair of arms needed to be made in Italy. This delayed shooting but they tried to film as much as they could without showing Popeye's arms to not further delay things. That giant mechanical octopus, also a nightmare to work with. And there was just so many technical issues that continued to delay filming and, worst off, inflated the budget. Let's look at the musical aspect of all this, and actually some other audio issues. For some reason, the musical numbers were actually performed live for the movie instead of being recorded in post-production. This is a nightmare even at the best of times, but this approach then created, as is not surprisingly, tons of technical issues as far as the sound of the movie and the music recording. Uh, This isn't ever really done. The the one example I could think of, I'm I'm sure there's others, but is the Les Mis movie where the singing performances you see um, throughout the movie are, are actually happening and the actors are, wear, are wearing earpieces where the piano tune is being played live for that song and they're going along with it. But of course, the, you know, the recording equipment's so much better for audio and everything, whether, you know, that was just a few years back. Th- this was a full-on nightmare. I don't know whose idea it was to try and record this all live, but that's what they did it with. Not only was this music difficult to capture, the dialogue was also too, specifically Robin Williams's interpretation of the classic Popeye voice. 
Williams had a lot of trouble capturing what everyone knew Popeye to sound like as that voice is ingrained in us. I mean, you probably watched the cartoon growing up. People watched it decades before that. There was a specific Popeye voice that we all know. Williams just couldn't get the voice right. He also had a ton of difficulty talking with this pipe in his mouth. Now they would have to dub a lot of his lines over in post-production. And then there was the issues with Robin Williams' notorious ad-libbing. Any movie that featured Robin Williams always had a ton of improvisation, as this is what you get when you get Robin Williams. He does so many takes in most movies that he doesn't even remember much of what he did in the previous takes. This is an interesting story. You might have heard this before. Chris Columbus, who's directed movies, you know, like Home Alone, the Harry Potter movies, uh, Gram- everything. Like He was on a podcast interview with Alec Baldwin on Here's the Thing, and he filmed Mrs. Doubtfire. When they were filming this movie, Robin Williams did so much improvising, they had enough footage for four different versions of the film. They had uh, like a family version, they had a PG version, they had a PG-13 version, and an NC-17 or R-rated version. That's how much he did from take to take that was, you know, borderline okay to completely inappropriate. So there's four different versions of that movie that could have existed, and they went with the more... PG based, not family, whatever that rating was. So rated, you know, just before I was getting to PG 13, but it's just, it's astounding what this man could do. And it was almost, they say like, he'd be like in a trance. He wouldn't rehearse anything. It would just naturally come out of him. He'd have no idea where it came from. The next tape take completely different. And he wouldn't remember what he had just done. It's pretty astounding. This, of course, would be common knowledge for anyone working with Robin Williams in the future, but this was his first feature film, and they did not understand how much improv he would actually do in the scene. So this just created another filming nightmare. So the movie was filmed in Malta. The entire town of Sweet Haven would be completely built on the island. The problem is they overbuilt the town and they didn't need that much of it to actually film the movie, and this killed the budget. But filming in Malta gave the movie a more unique look. You couldn't definitively say where it was filmed compared to the movies that are quite clearly filmed in like the US or the UK or whatever. Malta helped to create a bit of an otherworldly feel to it. To me, it always had that sort of Tatooine look almost. It was unique. I think it worked. Construction of Sweet Haven was only part of what they required to film in Malta, as they needed to create a one-stop shop to create the movie. They were also required to build crew quarters along with an editing studio just to keep this movie going along as fast as possible. A lot of the sets are still up to this day, and part of the town of Sweet Haven has been turned into an amusement park. You can actually, if you go on YouTube, you can look up tours of Sweet Haven and just see what it looks like today. So what was the response to the movie? Popeye came out on December 6, 1980 and opened to a $6 million weekend. It would actually do semi-decent by taking close to $50 million in North America. The critics were not too fond of it, calling it a messy bomb. It didn't have the worst rating of all time, just not where they should be for what was supposed to be a blockbuster. Again, you know, it's the, these numbers when you convert for today are okay you know six million opening weekend 50 million you know gross overall but you know this this was supposed to be a juggernaut movie roger ebert actually thought it was okay mainly praising the perfect casting of shelly duvall i mean really besides wendy torrance i mean she's made to play olive oil so critic wise it was okay and financially it would also just okay as it made money past its 20 million dollar budget But again, this was far from what was expected. Paramount worked with Disney to distribute this movie as they thought they had a goldmine on their hands. Again, kind of because of what happened with Annie. This didn't turn out to be the case. Audiences were pretty meh about it, and it only found a real following by kids. The returns on the film were nowhere near they were expected to be, and it was considered a major disappointment by the studios. There was so much hype going into this movie, and all of Hollywood seemed to have a vested interest in it. 
Word had been spreading about the project, and David Letterman tells a story where the producer of The Tonight Show, Fred DeCorva, whispered into Letterman's ear just before he's about to go on, onto The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson in front of the whole country. Letterman's about to walk out, and DeCorva whispers into his ear, Robin got Popeye. Just out of nowhere. Like, this is how big of a deal this was. And they were all up and coming comedians at the time. You know, you hear about the famous comedy store in LA, and it, that's, you know, when it was the old days of Jay Leno and Letterman and Robin Williams and all these people coming up. And so, again, this was a massive deal of what was supposed to be a gigantic movie. And one of these like small town guys had got it. The potential of the movie and the fact Williams had landed the role had just exalted this thing. So why was it such a flop? I really think tackling a Popeye movie was too much for this time period. The technology wasn't close to good enough to do it properly. And it just, it seems like something that can't be captured in real life. The other big issue was the music. Paramount was adamant about making this a musical to, again, try to recreate the success of Annie, but it just didn't work in this case. As a standalone non-musical, this movie probably could have worked, but the music just wasn't great and didn't seem to mesh well with the rest of the picture. Add to this the fact they were trying to film the musical scenes live, like I mentioned, and with all the other production problems, the complete filming experience was a nightmare. They went way over budget, way over time, and were forced to finish filming with whatever footage they had. And I think this is what you can see on the screen. I think it's pretty evident. And it's hard when you ever watch a movie, like how hard these things are to put together. When you watch a terrible movie that's falling apart, you just can only imagine what is going on behind the scenes to try and just get this thing out there. So the worse the movie the not that it's funnier but you're you're just trying to imagine the chaos that they just we got to get this thing done the other problem was there was no intended audience for the movie and i think that's what hurt it too the writing and the dialogue is not entirely geared toward kids and they would end up being the primary audience for it they probably should have gone with more of a dumbed down children's movie and not try to appeal to adults with it the problem was that Robin Williams was geared more towards adults and and I guess young adults too. And I think that's what they thought they were getting with this film. And that just, just didn't give it a true direction. Again, depending on how big a Robin Williams fan you were, uh, you depending what you saw him in, his stand-up comedy would really shock a lot of people. You know, at the time, people were always thinking they were going to see um, Mork and Mindy live and, and he did some obviously really filthy stuff and people learn that over the years and so that was the problem they just didn't know what they were getting going into this thing and the movie just didn't have a definitive direction basically they should have ditched the music aspect and made it a cartoony slapstick comedy again having seen the success of annie the studio just had dollar signs in their eyes i'll start winding it down here i find these stories fascinating about things that are supposed to be sure things and just don't work out. And I think another great, well, not modern now, but um, in the future after Popeye version of this is Last Action Hero with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I watched it again the other day. I don't think I'd seen that thing since it came out. And again, this was a can't miss movie. You got the biggest movie star in the world, this gigantic action film and this sort of fantastical element to it. And it just didn't work. The movie was another massive flop. Same thing with like the Waterworld movie. If you remember Kevin Costner, just everything seems to be in place with these things. And just sometimes, you know, the stars don't align. So this is interesting because this is a movie that we look back on to what it could have been. It's not that it's terrible. It's just not amazing. And it should have been amazing. What's interesting is to see Robin Williams in his first big screen role, doing a pretty good job playing an iconic cartoon character. It's interesting to see this master comedian at work in his first big screen appearance and how he was made for this sort of thing. So the legacy of Popeye is more the legacy of Robin Williams and the very beginning of the career of, you know, arguably the greatest comedic performer of all time. And you're seeing the very beginning of that whole trajectory. So for that sense, you know, it's probably worth checking out. 
but I'll finish it here. Hopefully you like this. Hope you found this interesting. Like I said, I always love these sort of stories. So I'll finish off again. Feel free to shut this off now, X out, whatever. What I just touched upon earlier with the Everything 80s Movie Club, which is patreon.com. If you don't know about that, it's a way to support small independent shows like this for as little as like a few bucks a month. And then there are different tiers. And then with each tier comes different rewards, the movie club being one of them. And, you know, it's the whole idea with patreon.com is just to be able to compete against this giant sort of podcast world that's growing between, you know, celebrities, corporations, giant podcast networks, makes it tougher for the little guy to stand out. And, you know, there's several shows I support on Patreon just because I love what they're doing. And, you know, you just want to give them that little extra boost. And podcasting as a medium is amazing and it's growing quickly, but it's growing so quickly that everyone's sort of jumping on board. So, you know, things like patreon.com are a way to, you know, just sort of separate things out a little bit. So like I said, you can go to patreon.com slash 80. So p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash 80s or wherever you're listening, there should be a link there. But that's it for me. Thank you for listening. I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.